Hello, thanks for joining me and today we're talking about the basic working pieces of studio lighting equipment. Here we go. So thanks for joining me today. This is one of two videos that are introducing people to studio lighting and studio lighting equipment, the very basics of it. Uh, one on safety and another one that is uh, what we're doing today and that is the basic working components of the studio. As always, everything that we do here is brought to you by Camera Lessons Online, where we believe something very simple, and that is that anybody has the capacity and, and the accessibility to be able to create beautiful visual imagery. And in order to facilitate that, we have the videos here. We have the four hour introductory class on the website and several books and free downloads. I encourage you to go and take a look at it. I'll put uh, a link on the screen as always and in the description. So today is just an introduction to the working pieces of the studio. Um, and so we're going to jump straight into those. We're going to start with flash and then get into strobe. Now what's key is that the studio for me is any place where I control the light that is illuminating my subject. That can be inside, that can be outside, it can be a living room, it can be a backyard or a park, or it can be a space that I set aside specifically for the purpose. And studio lighting equipment is becoming more and more portable over the last 10 years. That's been the driving factor inside of it. That and uh, uh, a lot of safety uh, things. When I first got into this industry, we were working with battery operated packs. The battery sat on the ground. We had to discharge them. And of course, there was a lot of safety concerns there. That has all gone away in favor of much safer battery solutions. Uh, but mostly we're going towards portability. And so we're going to talk about the pieces we use for auxiliary flash and then the related pieces we use in uh, studio lighting. So let's get into that. We start with the most basic and, and primary thing that we use in the studio and that is the light stand. Uh, this is one of course right here. In my safety video I talk about uh, air cushioned versus spring loaded light stands. Air cushioned does not hold more capacity, it doesn't go taller, but it lowers the equipment uh, much more smoothly. And so I only use uh, light stands that are air cushioned as opposed to spring loaded. It's usually about a $20 difference in cost and I feel it's well worth it. Um, there are several types of light stands. We have what's called C stands. These uh, have the actual legs that come out and then straight down and they're heavier based, which is safer. And they also uh, will take sandbags more easily. And again, that's a safety concern. They are more difficult to uh, move, so they're less portable. You'll also find rolling stands, which have wheels on them. And of course, you'll find boom arms, which are gonna be able to take a piece of lighting equipment and overhang it. Those are things that we're going to be uh, working with in other videos. And at the top of your light stand, uh, you might find that it's threaded as mine is. It's quarter threaded on the top, but they are not always by any means. Sometimes there's just a flat stud on them and both are totally normal pieces of equipment. You'll find both and that's totally fine. And you're going to find these in different heights. So at this point, we need to be able to attach our piece of equipment to it. And so we're going to first be attaching uh, an auxiliary flash. Now there's two ways to do this. When you get a flash, uh, you're also going to get this. And this is the, uh, the flash foot or the flash stand. And they are quarter threaded in the base. Now, of course, I could just attach this to the top, but then there's no articulation. The flash is just going to fire straight, or I could angle the head of the flash upwards, and that's not very useful. So I need to attach this onto something else to get real articulation. And at that point, I'm going to be using this. Now, this is an umbrella adapter. You can buy these in metal or plastic, and I'm just going to tell you to always buy metal. Plastic breaks very easily. I've broken three of them. Uh, metal ones just last a lot longer, and uh, they hold uh, tension a lot better, which makes them safer as well. Uh, and it's only like a difference of 5 to $10 in cost, so always buy these in metal. We uh, have multiple parts to this. First, of course, it sits over the top of my light stand. Sometimes you'll find them with a brass stud where it threads into the quarter base. I've never found a real use for using that. It makes it marginally taller, but not super useful. At that point, I'm just going to tighten down uh, here onto the light stand so that I'm tight. I've got an arm that's going to loosen and that allows for the pitch manipulation of the flash. Now, one thing that's key to point out here is that the arm pitches this top piece and right now we have this hole. This is actually the hole for uh, umbrellas or other types of equipment 
uh, what we call modifiers to attach into the piece. And that pitch is uh, completely isolated from the bass. I could actually reverse this if I wanted to. And it would be actually quite easy for me to be able to attach this upside down like this. Move this uh, stud that I have here up to the other side. I could certainly do that. Now, the reason that we don't is not that it fails or that it falls. The reason is if I do it this way, the modifier m does not move when the flash moves. And as a result, I don't get consistent light. So that is an incorrect position, meaning that there is an up and a down to umbrella adapters. So we always use them in the, in the configuration where the hole for the, umbrella, for the umbrella itself is moving with the flash head. All right, so this is a stud. They come in different uh, types. This one is elongated and it has a quarter thread on one side and a 3 8 thread on the other, depending on what kind of equipment you're attaching. We almost always use the quarter thread, but not always. It goes in there and of course I can tighten that down. Now we're gonna be working with things called modifiers. These change the uh, effective size of the light source. Now to understand size, I've got a video on that. I encourage you to check it out. That goes through here and we can tighten um, those types of modifiers, soft boxes, or umbrellas into that space. And at that point, I have a flash system. Now I'm gonna take this stud and I'm going to attach it to some equipment, to some equipment so that the flash sits on it. And there's two ways I can do this. The first, is with the flash stand that we already mentioned. It's quarter threaded on the base, as we said. I can tighten that in, and now I have a space for my flash to sit. And it can lock into place there, I can articulate it, I can rotate it, I can modify it, and I'm in good shape. That's a completely legitimate way of doing this. If I was to operate this way, when I have my flash receiver, and we're going to talk about receivers and transmitters here in a second, I can simply take this, I like to loop it over the handle, and then I can plug it into the flash and I'm ready to start shooting. Now if I didn't want to do it that way, if I wanted to bypass the flash stand, I could with almost all of the flash receivers that are out there, I could take this and see that it's quarter threaded with this particular one on the base here. Some are quarter threaded in two different places depending on the way you want to set it up. And with that, I can actually thread this guy into the stud, place it in. And now if I wanted to trigger the flash through the hot shoe, I could do so. And at this point, I'm relying on the firing pin of the flash to receive information through the shoe of the receiver and use no cabling whatsoever. Now, with all of your flashes, what's important to note is that you're going to see for what's called TTL flashes an array usually of dots or pins that's arrayed around the hot shoe of the flash. By the way, it's called a hot shoe because this is where electricity and uh, other information uh, transfers from the camera or the transmitter to the flash. A cold shoe is simply a piece of plastic that uses these same fittings in order to sit somewhere. So for instance, if I wanted to mount a microphone on top of a DSLR, it's typically a plastic cold shoe that sits in the same place where the flash would normally sit. That's your difference between hot and cold. So the middle pin is always what's called the firing pin, and this is the one that receives just the fire information, and manual triggering requires nothing more than just a firing pin and setting the power on the unit itself. Now, if the firing pin lines up perfectly, then placing the flash in this configuration is a fantastic way to go. If it slips out of alignment though, it will not fire. So I actually quite like, if I'm going to set it up this way, I actually do redundantly set up my cable. It's also not uncommon for me to hang the receiver from the umbrella adapter and simply run through the cable, which I find to be a little bit more foolproof because I've had flashes slightly slip out of alignment. I've had shoes not totally fire. This one is actually tightened and locked in and I can still pop it straight off uh, with just a little bit of force. So as a result, know your equipment and how tight it is when you lock it into place and you'll be able to quite simply uh, set these up in such a way that they won't slip or uh, fail on you because you want them to fire every single time in order to get consistent results when you're working in the studio. So 
We're gonna set this up in the way that I typically do, and that's actually hanging the transmitter. So we're going to remove it. We're going to then take the, what's called receiver off of the brass stud. And I like to use the wrist straps that oftentimes accompany these, and I hang them from the light stand at some point. Then it's not uncommon for me to just use the flash stand. Take my flash itself, lock it into place, and I am gonna run the 3.5 millimeter cable here as my firing signal. Now, little 3.5 millimeter cables like this, or what's called PC Sync, which is a uh, round connection piece. It's not used very often anymore, but you still find it. These are for manual triggering only. So they're just the firing signal. Uh, if I want to run TTL, I really do need to run TTL from the hot shoe in some capacity or through radio frequency built into the unit. But here I could just plug that straight in and now I'm ready to fire. So let's talk about triggering so that that whole process makes sense. When we want a flash to fire, there are effectively about three separate ways that we can do it, but we only these days use two. The first and the oldest is going to be a direct cabled connection, hot shoe to hot shoe. And you're gonna see TTL cables still sold in some shops, but I do not recommend them, and I'll tell you why. TTL cables are the oldest technology. It actually just extends the hot shoe from your camera straight to the base of the flash. We lock it into place and it's the same to the flash, indistinguishable, as actually being on top of the camera. If it's a TTL flash, it receives the same TTL information. If it's set to manual, it's the same firing signal and that's fine. The reason that we don't use these any longer is that flashes have a capacity to feed back power through the cable to the camera and they always have. The thing is that when we ran film in cameras, a small amount of voltage running through a piece of film just did not affect anybody's life and no one ever noticed. But it is possible, though very rare, for power to feedback from a flash through a TTL cable into the camera and actually burn out a sensor or cause other kinds of damage. It will not electrocute you, but it is uh, powerful enough that it can actually damage the camera. And with the sensitivity of today's cameras, we don't wanna risk it. So TTL cables, you might still see them. I advise not using them. That means triggering the flash wirelessly, which of course is what everybody wants. Now there's two ways to do that. There's what's called the optical slave system and what's called radio frequency. So let's get into that. Optical slave is when there is a pre-flash embedded in some flash connected to the camera that triggers this one to fire. Now this is not a, a video about how that works. That's gonna be something we talk about later. So right now, just know that it requires a flash on the camera and for this one to have line of sight to see it. The problem is of course the line of sight aspect. If this is inside of a soft box or if it's behind a subject as this video light is for me that's lighting the background here, in those instances, it does not fire because it needs line of sight to be able to see. And so we don't like that system very much if we can help it, but in a pinch it works and I've certainly taken advantage of it multiple times. Instead, we prefer radio frequency. Radio frequency, uh, of course, is a preferred method of sending information longer distances. It moves through objects, it travels without degradation farther, uh, and it's just a more useful thing. It moves through soft boxes and walls and people and can trigger a flash to fire even when obstructed or even severely uh, obstructed, which is nice. Now you need radio frequency to either be built into the receiving unit or have some kind of a receiver for that radio frequency that it's connected to. Now, you'll have both TTL and manual uh, transmitters and receivers. Transmitter sits, of course, on top of the camera and sends out a firing signal. If it's a TTL transmitter, then it's uh, also telling the flash how much power to output. This is just a manual trigger, which is just the firing signal, and I have to set the power on the unit itself. For my pro photos, I do have a TTL uh, transmitter, and that will allow me to uh, both have the camera inform the unit of how much power to put out. Not only that, but it will um, allow me to control groups and channels. That's something we're gonna talk about in a different video. So TTL transmitter or manual transmitter. If you're TTL, you have to be TTL throughout the entire chain. I can't have a TTL transmitter, a manual receiver, and have TTL information in the flash. 
So one break in the chain and the whole thing uh, is no longer TTL, but I can still take flashes, dumb them down into manual, daisy chain them together and they work, which is a really nice way of working with multiple pieces from multiple manufacturers and get everything to fire together. Manual works brilliantly for being able to basically cobble together a lighting system and also teaches you a lot about light, so I advise it. So we have a transmitter on the camera and a receiver here that's connected to the flash. Uh, if the flash had the receiver built in, this would be like the Canon 600EX system or uh, like the uh, Sony's uh, RF system that they have in the 60 and the 45 or in the SP5000 Nikon or in the Metro's flashes. Uh, then you actually have the receiver there and you only need the transmitter on the camera. The nice thing about radio frequency built into flashes these days is that it's almost exclusively TTL, so is the transmitter, so you do get TTL information, which is very nice. So now let's talk about if we're working with a studio strobe. Uh, I always differentiate strobe from flash. A flash for me is anything that goes onto the camera. We also call them speed lights, where a strobe is something that physically could not go onto the uh, onto the camera itself. It's just not made for it, even though I guess if I rigged a bunch of adapters together, I could make it happen, but it would be a very bad idea. So this is my strobe. This is a Profoto B1. Uh, and what's key about this particular one is that uh, it is battery operated. You will see them plug into a wall uh, or you will see them battery operated these days. This happens to be a battery operated one, though I've worked with many ones that just plug straight into the wall. Those are perfectly good to work with, which is nice. Um, it has, like just about every strobe out there, it has its umbrella adapter built in because these need to be uh, basically reinforced to hold the weight of the unit itself. So we'll see a place for uh, modifiers to go into uh, and that's also where it's able to connect. Here, with this particular one, uh, umbrellas actually go into the top piece here. With other ones, they'll sit inside of the umbrella adapter here, but you'll see multiple ways for that to attach. They always articulate the modifier with the strobe head. Just like with the flash, they attach to the same place. We just have not used an umbrella adapter on the light stand. Uh, it's good to note here that there is no requirement for this to have a quarter thread on it whatsoever. A normal brass stud is totally fine built into the light stand. We do not require it. And if we use the umbrella adapter that we had with the flash, we wouldn't need to have it either. This just also accommodates a flash stand going straight onto the piece if we wanted it to, uh, though that's usually not the best way of accomplishing it. With this guy here, I do have the ability to attach modifiers through the top. I've got the flash head here. I have a handle and I have my controls on the back. This one, as I said, is battery operated. So of course we have our battery. If we were running power cable, we would run it down. I like to use little twist ties to tie it to the stand to make sure that it doesn't move away from me. And then I like to gaffer tape those uh, in places to the floor. Now this particular unit does have a, tr a uh, receiver built into it. But if I wasn't using that, and there are a couple reasons why I might not, that's when I could use the exact same transmitter and receiver system that we used with flashes. Using the exact same way, I'll hang it from the unit here, and then I can take my cable and I can plug it straight into the unit, same 3.5 millimeter. Older strobes you'll see uh, using quarter inch, though this is not used in equipment anymore. You'll see PC sync every now and then, but it's usually this small 3.5 millimeter that we use uh, in the studio today. Now, why might I use this transmitter and receiving system rather than the one that uh, is built in? There are a couple reasons. If I wanted to mix uh, the flash that I had before in a shot with the strobe, I'd have to use a single basic uh, firing signal that I could attach to all of those units because you can only have one type of transmission in any one shot for them to all actually work. So that means I have to bypass the receiver built into the unit. Another one might be, uh, frankly, that if you pick these guys up, 
um, uh, Profoto and some of the other companies might have some pretty expensive triggers. Uh, the the uh, TTL triggers for Profoto are like $400 and so you can run some very inexpensive manual triggers and get the unit to operate perfectly. I just have to set the power on the unit itself which is totally fine. So I've got my handle, I've got my battery, I've got the flash head and now let's talk about what I've been referring to this whole time which is modifiers. Please take a look at the video that I made on specularity. Uh, a little while back and you'll understand the concept of modifiers a little bit but basically a modifier is anything that we use that changes the effective size of the light in the studio. The effective size is how big the last uh, thing is that the light comes from. So if I took this and I fired it at you the flash head is the light source. If I fired it against the ceiling the size of the spread of light on the ceiling that reflected down that is the new size of the light source. If I was to put a snoot on this which narrows it down then a smaller head would effectively be my light source. So a modifier is anything that changes the effective size of the light source in the shot. I say effective because of course the actual physical dimensions of the unit remain unchanged but for purposes in what we record in the actual uh, image the effective size can change dramatically. And so now let's take a look at a softbox. This is one that attaches to um, umbrella, uh, um, umbrella adapters for flashes very, very easily. This is uh, one, it's an Apollo from Westcott. So when I take this, I have a shaft here that moves into the actual umbrella adapter. The flash can sit inside of this. And now this 20 by 20 inch uh, modifier is the new size of my light source. I could actually adapt this onto the Profoto head and get it to fire as well, though it would take up a lot more space inside of it. You'll see uh, soft boxes that you have to construct and you will use things called speed rings to attach them onto the unit or you'll find ones that are made to fit directly onto the flash head or the strobe head themselves which is a more convenient way of attaching those. There are two major types of connections, uh, what's called Bowens and what's called Elinchrome, and those are the actual types of the rings that lock onto the unit. Profoto invented their own, which of course they use, and you'll see some other ones out there as well, uh, the Pulse Buff or uh, ones that are called Universal that use tightening rods to tighten onto the flash head. So you'll see lots of different ways of mounting a softbox onto the unit itself. My preferred method mechanism is Bowen's because it's a very very simple lock-in mechanism. Photox uses them with a lot of their strobes. So these are the working pieces that we use in the studio. The light stand, the flash head, the triggers themselves, and the modifiers. And understanding a little bit of variance is going to make you effective as you're looking at equipment and knowing what's going to be useful. Thank you for joining me and happy shooting.